It has revolutionized the way we work, play, travel, and communicate. It touches almost every part of our lives. It has already helped us win wars, solve seemingly insolvable problems, and launch us into space. Most people today own a personal computer, along with a mouse, a monitor, two keyboards, and everything else it needs to run. A computer has input devices such as a mouse and keyboard, the brains of the machine known as the CPU or central processing unit, and output devices such as a printer or the StarOffice.com office productivity suite. A binary code of ones and zeros is all the computer knows and uses to make calculations, and allows users to do anything from office work to playing the latest video games such as the Half-Life trilogy. But every computer, from warehouse-filling supercomputers to the one in your own home, can trace its ancestral lineage back to a man. A man who loved choo-choo trains. Charles Babbage was an English scientist who invented the cow piercer, a long metal wedge placed in front of trains to slice through any cows that wandered onto the tracks so that the train wouldn't derail. Babbage is also considered by many to be the father of the computer. Being a scientist, Babbage relied on logarithmic and gravity charts to calculate everything, from the meals he ate, to the clothes he wore, to his sex life. Computing these charts were people, called computers, since there were no computers to call people. Unfortunately, these human computers often made mistakes, which really pissed Babbage off. After being told he couldn't legally starve his employees to death, Babbage knew he needed another solution. He first envisioned a complex series of gears, shafts, whirligigs, doodads, and spinsters that worked together to make calculations. After 10 years of work, however, he got bored and decided to design something else. A machine that possessed all the basic components of modern computers. Mechanisms and punch cards on this machine performed calculations that were considered too complex for terrestrial life. And so, Babbage dubbed his creation the Alienware Computer. Producing the Alienware Computer would have proved too expensive for Babbage, however, as he noticed all the components needed for it at the time were vastly overpriced. And so, the machine was never built. It would be well over 100 years before anyone ever thought again to make a programmable computation device. 1890, the year of immigrants. Nine million immigrants. And the U.S. Census was not prepared. For the 1880 census, the U.S. Census Bureau had submitted a single piece of paper to the U.S. government that simply read, Fuck man, I don't know, like, a lot of people? And the government wasn't going to accept that for the fourth year in a row. The government was in a tight bind. They were desperate to hire a scientist to find a solution to this problem, but not so desperate that they were willing to overturn the law forcing all scientists to have incredibly impressive mustaches. Enter Herman Hollerith. Herman Hollerith, former DeVry University instructor, developed an incremental person counting machine. Essentially, the machine would count each person who entered America, and added that count to a stored data point they fulfilled, such as race, sex, and age, all displayed on a series of clock-like dials. In just six weeks, the 1890 census count of 42,482,803 was completed. And it was off by a little more than 20 million. Because of this, Hollerith went on to do absolutely nothing important, and history regarded him as a failure. But 50 years later, enter World War Motherfucking Two. Armed with fast hands so their husbands wouldn't complain, Data entrants would use mechanical devices to keep track of the population, such as tallying up railroad passengers, life insurance policies, and KY jelly rations. But the first electronic digital computers were built with a much more compelling aim in mind. Winning, or at least getting second place in, 
a world war. One of the earliest machines was proposed by the British to break the famous German encryption code known as the Scheiße Code. One of the people who worked to break the code was famed homosexual Alan Turing. His work before the war on the Nintendo Entertainment System established a theoretical basis for the computers built in the 1930s. North of London at a secret installation, Turing and his wife built Colossus, a computer-like machine designed to break the Germans' encryption code. Colossus compared sequences of letters at a rate of about three characters per second. It also doubled as an espresso machine, which people said tasted okay, I guess. Those were its only two functions. At the same time, in America, the world's strongest country, engineers were working on a machine that would influence the design for all future computers. America was a powerhouse of manufacturing war machines, from planes to choo-choo trains to tanks. But Americans were notoriously slow when it came to math. American soldiers firing artillery struggled when it came to calculating ranges of numbers over three digits. And if the range was above four digits, shells could be so inaccurate they could impact China or the moon. Human calculators at the time were no help, as they were busy during the war trying to calculate the world's largest number, believing knowledge of it would give them an edge over the rest of the world. To solve the problem, John Mockley, a physicist from Pennsylvania, proposed building a giant electronic computer, which, instead of taking many hours to calculate artillery ranges, could calculate them in a shorter number of hours. The army was desperate to win the war, and when they were shown the computer proposal, they responded with, shut up nerd, and continued to focus on slapping Japan silly. So Mockley scrounged up some investors to make it instead. Mockley, and a brilliant man who was already balding in his mid-twenties, Presper Eckert, set to work on constructing the ENIAC, the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Cox, I mean computer, excuse me. Many times larger than Colossus, nothing like this had ever been conceived. Nearly 100 feet long, weighing 30 tons, and with two separate bingo displays, it was the world's first high-end gaming computer. It contained 10,000 capacitors, 6,000 switches, 18,000 vacuum tubes, and not one, but two espresso machines. Vacuum tubes burn out just like light bulbs. Since the ENIAC contained 18,000 of them, it could be seen from space. If its tubes didn't burn out all the time and needed to be replaced every two minutes. After two years of work, ENIAC was completed three months after the Japanese surrendered, completely missing the deadline. Because of this, the ENIAC was essentially decommissioned and given to a group of women to play with. Today, this would be of little consequence, but back in the 1940s, this was considered massively degrading because a woman operating a computer was a second-class felony. Before you feel too sorry for the ENIAC, it's important to remember how primitive this machine was. It couldn't perform any logical operations based on its calculations, and it had to be fully rewired any time it was going to switch tasks. Would you rather be watching this video on the ENIAC than your smartphone? I didn't think so. And I'll bet the ENIAC couldn't even play Crisis on the lowest settings. What a piece of shit. Realizing computers may be a useful utility for the business world, Eckerd and Mockley went off to start their own company. They set off to work on a new machine called the Universal National International Vacational American Computer, or the UNIVAC. The UNIVAC was the first mass-produced computer, designed to be programmable for a variety of purposes. The machine was perfect for the business market, able to encapsulate tasks such as payroll, inventory, and billing. However, the machine lacked an espresso maker, and because of this, Eckert and Mockley went on to do absolutely nothing important, and history regarded them as failures. Within the UNIVAC, compact magnetic tape drives stored data, and results were automatically printed. Still, very few people actually understood how useful computers could be. This all changed on election night of 1952, the presidential race between Dwight Eisenhower and Adlai Stevenson.
Opinion polls and voter data predicted the election should skew slightly in Stevenson's favor. But engineers working at the US government fed data on the candidates into the UNIVAC, which mathematically determined that Eisenhower should be president. And so, Eisenhower was given the presidency, regardless of the election results. After the success of the UNIVAC, many companies began to see the potential of computers. But it was a certain race to the moon that really pushed their evolution. In 1961, America was in second place behind Russia in the race for space. Unfortunately, this race only had two competitors. NASA decided to take home the gold by landing a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Astronauts in space couldn't rely on mental math or guess and check methods to perform the calculations needed for their spaceflight, and the computer they would need to use took up an entire room. NASA looked to shrink the problem rather than deal with it directly, just like my ex-wife. Fortunately, breakthroughs in miniaturization were already being made. The first being the transistor, invented in 1947. Transistors are not computers, so they will not be covered in this program. For more information, watch the Modern Day Marvels episode on transistors. Later on, Robert Wipe and Jack Killchildren, two engineers at rival transistor companies, simultaneously came up with a new revolution in computer miniaturization. They took a chip and layered it with an entire network of electrical components, creating a new chip that was micro in size, but contained a lot of power for a micro-sized chip. They dubbed it the Integrated Circuit. In 1969, two identical computers were built with over 5,000 of these micro-integrated circuit chips. One aboard the Lunar Orbiter, and the other was left aboard the Lunar Orbiter by mistake. During the flight to the moon, NASA had to ask the astronauts aboard the Apollo 11 very nicely if they could please run calculations for them while they were in space, promising in exchange to throw them a pizza party upon their return. As Neil Armstrong was slaying some moon pussy, a giant nerd named Ted Hoff was doing some nerd shit like playing D&D or inventing the microprocessor or reading comic books or whatever, who cares? Because of the invention of the microprocessor, computers were on their way to being smaller, but they were still far from easy to use. One of the earliest attempts to simplify the computer interface was led by Doug Engelbart. <laughs> Engelbart. Engelbart <laughs> demonstrated a prototype personal computer in 1968. Utilizing a keyboard and a magic pointing automaton he called a mouse. <laughs> Engel Engelbart <laughs> showed basic computer functionalities such as clicking on screens, links, and hypertext. Unfortunately, he wanted to call all computers designed by him Engelbart machines. <laughs> Which was a large deal breaker for most investors. Because of this, Engelbart went on to do absolutely nothing important, and history regarded him as a failure. Some of those in attendance were engineers at the Xerox company. Xerox believed the future was definitely going to be in either computers or panhandling. They flipped a coin and decided to dedicate their company to building computers. In 1973, they introduced the Alto, which had many features we find standard in computers today, such as a mouse, a graphical interface, built-in networking, and a grandmother accidentally downloading viruses sent to her in scam emails. But the machine left little impact because at $1,800, very few individuals could afford to bring the Alto into their homes. Wait, eighteen hundred dollars? Is that right? That's 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 really not that much, especially for like a brand new revolutionary computer. I mean, surely like people could just save up for it. And then, oh, I oh oh I forgot inflation. Oh shit, hang on. Wow, yeah, yeah. Never mind. Damn, I inflation's a bitch. 
Computers of the past were elite machines, owned by the government, large corporations, superheroes, and universities. Giant mainframes processed payrolls, large spools of magnetic tape saved and retrieved records, and a single woman named Joanne was hired to do everyone's typing for them. But the chip market was growing, and as processing speeds grew, prices declined, and cool ranch flavor was introduced. The computer revolution was finally at hand. And it was in the filthy, grimy hands of these two men, Steven Wozniak and Steve Jobs. In the mid-1970s, Wozniak and Jobs started to make small personal computers out of their garage. They dubbed this machine the Apple One. But this was a pretty pathetic achievement, all things considered, as thanks to lowering chip costs, inexpensive do-it-yourself-at-home dumb baby computer building kits started showing up on store shelves. The Altair was one of the most popular computer kits, boasting to have enough functionality to rival commercial models. And at a reasonable $19,000, it soon found itself in nearly every American home. Inspired by computer kits like the Altair to actually do something with their lives, in 1977, Woz Stevens and Job Steves developed the Apple II, a self-contained computer, monitor, and keyboard. An optional floppy disk drive was also offered for some reason. Mostly, typical business computers were priced anywhere from $1,200 to $1,300. The Apple II was sold at an MSRP $5 lower than that, at $1,195. Because of this, the Apple II soon completely swept the home and business computer market and absolutely obliterated its competitors. The Apple II made it easy for anyone with a collared shirt to awkwardly henpeck at a keyboard as their stepdad watched over their shoulder. The device was remarkably plug and play. Any user could immediately begin to program the computer, or buy software from the blossoming software companies, such as the most popular game of 1977, Smug Frog's Jumping Catastrophe. Little-known company IBM appeared out of nowhere in 1981 with a competitor to the Apple II, simply known as the PC. Computer sales boomed slightly in the 1980s, but before computers could completely dominate the home market, they had to shake their nerdy image and appeal to cool people, such as school bullies and men who wore pink button-up shirts. To do this, Apple took the earlier work done by Xerox and integrated it into their machine, making graphical interfaces and mouse controls standard. With this, the Macintosh computer was born in 1984. The revolution behind the Macintosh came from its use of the operating system and software, Software is the electronic Simon Says of a computer. Inside a computer, software turns on various lights on the motherboard, and the computer has to race to turn them off. The resulting electrical signals output is a program, whether it be a spreadsheet, web browser, or video game. Increasingly, software was dominating the computer market, and there to capitalize it was the young, naive, almost clueless president of a software company called Microsoft, Bill Gates. Eventually, somehow, Bill Gates would grow older and larger and become a household name as the man who screamed night and day about how bad malaria is. Unrelated to this, back in 1981, IBM decided to purchase Microsoft's operating system, known as DOS, for their personal computers. IBM clones sprung up on the market, who also sold Microsoft's operating system, because Microsoft had no integrity. Apple held on to Macintosh's proprietary operating system, while brand options for Windows PCs became extensive. And raising sales of both systems was their dual compatibility with the hottest game of 1981, Teleport Gold 2. But then, out of nowhere, Microsoft stole the windowed programs, pulled down window interfaces, and windows of Macintosh's OS to create their own operating system. Windows. Doomputer sales skyrocketed in the 1980s, going from 500,000 machines in 1981 to 7 million by the end of the decade. That's as much as the entire population of Germany, if you removed all but 7 million German citizens. 
people grew excited to see more user-friendly interfaces, more fascinating software, and even some computers with a built-in connection to Sir Isaac Newton. But the revolution had only begun, and with a worldwide network of computers on the horizon, all wilderness on Earth was soon going to be torn down to make way for digital wildlife. In the 1990s, the World Wide Web, despite how off-puttingly ugly it was, pushed computer sales into a massive explosion. Computers also began to become sleeker and more modern, such as this footstool computer, also known as the most impractical computer ever made. Recently, portable electronic personal assistants have also surged into the market. They can even be attached to a keyboard, completely ruining their portability. And that keyboard can also be folded away, making me look like a fucking idiot. Microprocessors are a part of nearly everyone's daily life. Computers can do everything from order your food to convert your email text into speech that isn't accurate in the slightest. It's the continued shrinkage of computer chip technology that's pushing the rest of the industry forward. This circuit board wafer contains over 200 Pentium 3 microprocessors. Intel hopes in the coming years to get them to actually do something after they've been haphazardly jammed into the same wafer. They were originally being tested as a disco ball, with less than stellar results. Computer chips are made by a process called photolithography. Manufacturers start by coating concentrated television static with a layer of photogenic yellow. Scientists then use erosion from flowing sand to form the labyrinth. Ultraviolet light is shined onto the labyrinth, unlocking its secrets within the photogenic yellow. Microprocessor chips are found at the end of the labyrinth. Those chips act as mini computers and are finding themselves in more and more devices every day. One example is this camera that bombards you with chemotherapy and even wirelessly transfers it to your relatives. Soon, nearly everything in your home will be hooked up to the internet. But this is a much older idea than most people would think, as evidenced in this archival footage from 1958. Here are some women talking on the phone. Don't worry, fellas. While this would normally be illegal, these women have special permission from the government because they're talking to their oven. This is just one of the amazing future technologies that Dick and Balls Pharmaceuticals still has in development that allows you to call your oven whenever you want, day or night. While many of us probably don't have much use for talking to our oven, wouldn't all of us like a smart fridge that can order groceries and write shopping lists and then sit there totally unused three months after you bought it? Tomorrow, the Dick and Balls telephone operation system may allow you to feed your pets. Close your windows. And even launch your house into the cold, unforgiving vacuum of space. Computers are always getting smaller. Sometimes maybe a little too small for Hugo and his big bone-crushing meat slabs. Scientists at Hewlett-Packard are working on a molecular computer. This computer rearranges molecules to toggle functionality on and off. Unfortunately, in its current state, molecular computing is agonizingly slow, and oftentimes fails to work properly. This is due to the major logistical flaw of being designed by Hewlett-Packard. Engineers foresee building a molecular computer by interlocking molecules with a series of nanowires. This computer will be used for playing the most radical game of tic-tac-toe ever, and nothing else. Computers will continue to evolve using the power of money. Libraries. Science. And no clip. Systems like this high-end gaming rig have gotten so advanced, they can seemingly mimic human intelligence. 
Whether it's playing chess, diagnosing illnesses, or murdering other human beings for living in different countries, computers can operate at near human levels. In 1950, Alan Turing, known failure who went on to do absolutely nothing important, envisioned a time where computers could think. When IBM's Deep Blue supercomputer beat the incredibly red chess world champion Garry Kasparov, some people lost some respect for the game of chess. People who weren't idiots, however, saw that this was an incredible step in computing technology. Technology is a double-edged sword. On one hand, humanity has access to more pornography than it ever has in all of human history. But on the other hand, humanity now has access to more pornography than it ever has in all of human history. Computer power has increased by over a factor of 100 million in the last 50 years. Could we maybe, in time, create the perfect computer? There it is.